So um, this is what we're talking about, being a primary care doctor. And my, my subtitle here is, what was I thinking? Okay, and that's a good question. Actually going through this, I think you're all gonna find that you get drawn into things for lots of reasons and there are lots of people who influence you. Uh, for me, one of the people who influenced me the most was my grandmother who uh, felt that I was the first one in the family to go to college. Uh, and long before that, she was sure that I was gonna be a doctor. And I think part of it came with the confusion um, that this is who I was. Oops, sorry. Uh, are we still sharing? Are we still there? You sharing? Yeah, yeah, I think you're in, you gotta go to a presenter mode. I think you're in a different mode. Uh, go to display settings in the top middle there, I think. Display settings. Right under you, yep. Screen sharing, it says. There's nothing coming down there. Is it, if you click that, it doesn't change? Where it says, your mouse is just there, display settings, right at the, if you go to the top left where it says show task bar, right next to it, it says display settings. You're talking about like on the PowerPoint, not on the Zoom controls. Yeah, I'm on the PowerPoint, yep. yeah. Uh, where am I here? Damn. In line with the B of becoming, go straight up. <laughs> it says In display the... settings with a little arrow. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, got it, sorry. No problem. Okay. Yep. Then click that, see if it dropped down. And then uh, I think well, it's, try that, yeah. Better. Okay. All right. So let me go to my next look, all right. Okay, good. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. So Richard, this is how my grandmother saw me when I was uh, five years old, okay? Thanks for being here, by the way. My pleasure. Good to see you again. And this is somebody who I'm sure nobody here really remembers, but James Kildare was a physician on television in Hollywood. And uh, she was convinced that I not only looked like him, but that I would aspire to do the same wonderful things that he has done. This actually is who I was at the time. And I was basically the general manager of the, the Halliday Duty Store in uh, Dutyville, USA, and quite happy doing that, to be perfectly honest. Um, so somewhere between here and there became this journey, this, this thought of, okay, what am I going to be? How do I do this? And how much of it actually was my choice? You know, we never really know, but I started becoming very interested in medicine. And there were lots of things that impressed me. One was I grew up in an area that this was a beautiful spring day and, uh, I, I was, laying in bed with 105 fever. And my, uh, my dad, who was a medic during World War II, but wasn't very good at dealing with illness, uh, called the doctor frantically and saying, look, you, you got to get here. You know, this, this guy's burning up. You got to get here. And out my window came old Doc Harwin trudging through the snowstorm. And although this is not an actual picture, and I hope that's a thermometer and not a cigarette in the patient's mouth and the doctor's mouth. Um, you know, he tended to me. And this made an amazing impression on me. And, I, you know, here, how, how do people do this? And he gave me a shot of some penicillin that really, really hurt. Um, and the next day I was better. So it was kind of, you know, it was miraculous. And it was enormous amount of sacrifice. I mean, this was not, you know, he was an old guy and he was coming through a snowstorm with the plow truck right in front of him because somebody needed him. So, you know, that became kind of my journey um, to, I decided I'm gonna go to medical school and I'm gonna become a doctor. And I certainly didn't have any idea what kind of doctor, but you know, uh, this, these were my initial influences. Um, and my, my journey was not a straight line, okay? Uh, I started at university here, uh, and I, I, did, I did my darndest. Um, I, I worked hard. Um, I did well. Um, I did okay on the MCATs. I did all those things, and 
you know, I was applying to med school when Vietnam was just winding down and affirmative action was just winding up and there were lots and lots of other issues. And despite, you know, applying to a whole bunch of schools, I didn't get into any schools at all. Uh, and I was like, nah, what am I going to do now? I guess I'm going to figure out a plan B. Now, again, you have to keep in mind that we're talking about like 1975 and there's no internet and the amount of research that you do is basically calling somebody and saying, you know, what do I do? Do you know anybody? What's the other path? So I went basically from here to somewhere here and to Brussels. Uh, to the Université Libre de Bruxelles. And I decided, look, it's only a seven year program and it's in French and it's oral exams. I mean, how hard can it be? Well, it was really, really hard. And, um, you know, the, the culture was difficult. The language was difficult, but I persevered and they had a program where you could get a master's in science in one year and then matriculate to the medical school from there. Uh, so I said, okay, we'll try that. And I did that and uh, did well and really enjoyed it and really had a, a really good time. I got my master's and they accepted me into the next six years of this, uh, which was only going to get harder. And then one of my friends said, hey, you know what? Um, there's this school in Mexico down here that, uh, you know, pretty much follows an American medical school curriculum. Uh, it's basically recognized in the United States. You can do your undergraduate, you can do your medical school studies there. You can come back to the States, do your clerkships, you know, and it's sunny, you know, which is nice because in Brussels in 14 months, I only saw the sun two days. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I said, okay, fine. So I took my French and I turned it into Spanish. And still to this day, when I speak Spanish, every once in a while, I'll throw in French. Uh, and moved over here. So while I was in med school, or when I was in uh, college, sorry, when I was in college, just as to give you some stories and, you know, now, okay, fine, I'm a professor of clinical medicine, you know, I'm respected enough to be included in this. These are great things, but it doesn't start out like that. It really doesn't. So my very first experience was in college when, uh, I was a, an orderly at the county hospital. And that was what I did as a part-time job. And the docs there who remember were only like a couple of years older than me, the interns and thing, uh, they agreed to um, kind of show me stuff when I, when I was able, you know, just to give me a little introduction as to what medicine was. So this day will live in infamy in my mind, but uh, I was, advised by the senior resident say, listen, you know, Rich, come along. We're doing this really cool procedure. Uh, and it's called a, a cerebral angiogram. And we're going to put dye into the carotid artery. We're going to shoot some dye into the brain. We're going to take x-rays and you get to see all the blood vessels and where they go. I said, that's very, very cool. So I went along with them. I stood on the side of the procedure table. Uh, and the way the procedure is done is you have a, you have a needle that has a, a hollow, and so it has a trocar and an introducer, right? So it's a needle, and inside has a little piece that closes it off. They push it into the carotid artery, and then they back it off with the top off. And when the top is, and when the blood spurts out, this is what I saw. And uh, that's as much the angiogram I ever saw. This is where I was next. I was flat on my back in the emergency room with 10 stitches on the top of my head uh, as a little reminder that you got a lot to learn, buddy. So, you know, so this was, these were the kind of experiences that really, you know, mold you and they really make you think about, my God, I mean, how, how much could I possibly learn? How overwhelming is this? Is there, is there a way I'm ever going to be able to get there? And, and the answer is, yeah, there is a way. And it takes years, and it's going to take years, and uh, you can do it. But, you know, as Dr. Kayako said, explained so brilliantly, this is just, a, you know, a journey. You just keep doing it and doing it and doing it, right? And then eventually, you get good at it. And if you love it, you're dedicated. And what that expression, you know, if you love your work, and you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And that's 
pretty much it. So then medical school, doing the clerkships, doing all that other kind of things, just to give you, because I, I want to humble myself before all of you, because I don't want you to think that this is not attainable. Um, I, I did this clerkship at a local hospital um, back in the U.S. of A. And uh, it was a very prestigious hospital. And people were really very good. And this is, you know, okay, so I'm a doctor, or why don't I own a microwave? And I, I really do not own a microwave. I'm much to my wife's chagrin, but I do not own a microwave. And this is the reason why. Because I was working in this hospital, and the hospital had a cafeteria. And the cafeteria did not serve hot food. It just had like vending machines. And in the old days, this is what a microwave looked like. Right? It, actually, it was actually even bigger, but this is the best picture I could find. And <clears throat> we're sitting there with me and a couple of other sub interns and we're, you know, we're talking about how overwhelmed we are. And the gentleman goes, he gets his food out of the, you know, the cold storage thing, puts it in the microwave, pushes the button, collapses on the floor, literally he hits the floor, boom, he's dead, right? This is incredible. So now everybody's looking at me because the cafeteria was for guests and for everybody. And I was the only guy in a little short white coat and everybody's staring at me. So I did, you know, what you do. You know, I got up, I ran over, I ran around a few times and, and I, I reached down and I picked up his head and I looked out and I screamed at the top of my lungs, quick, somebody call a doctor. And needless to say, that was another moment of great discredit for me there. But eventually I learned, and the backside of the story is that this microwave was not shielded. And this patient had uh, an old fashioned pacemaker. And when he pushed the microwave, it turned his pacemaker off. And since he was pacemaker dependent, he had no pulse. So of course I know that now, but I did not know that. So, so you know, can, will you be stupid? You'll be stupid. And will you be embarrassed? Yes, you'll be embarrassed, but it always gets better. All right, so this is the deal about primary care medicine. Primary care medicine is different than a lot of things you've been hearing so far because it's long haul. I mean, and this is something, you know, I just, I say, um, I, I don't know if it's really clear, but as you've been watching, these guys, you know, the neurosurgeons, the cardiovascular surgeons, they change a life literally in a minute. I mean, they'll go in there, they'll put a coil in an aneurysm, they'll put a stent in a heart, they'll do these amazing things, and they will literally change a patient's life in a minute. Primary care doctor, it's going to take you a lifetime. You're going to be in it from the day that patient's old enough to see you until the day that patient leaves you or you leave them. And your rewards are all the way through rewards are part of the journey. And as that patient includes you in their life, you'll be happy. And as that patient does well, you'll be happy. And if that patient does badly, you'll be really very sad. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, the pros and cons of, of being a primary care doctor. Okay. So one of the things is, like I said, you have to be willing to develop a long-term relationship, or you have to have the desire to develop a long-term relationship. You can't really, you know, expect things to change quickly. There, the other thing is, it's the challenge of not knowing what's case is next. What are you doing next? I mean, if I show you my schedule today, on my schedule, there will be two people coming in for COVID testing and they're going to tell me all about their exposures and what they did. And I'm going to have to counsel them about that. I'll have somebody coming in for a follow-up with diabetes. I have somebody else coming in with anxiety. I have another person coming in because their hip hurts. And this is the day. Literally, you look at your calendar and you have no idea what your next case is going to be. So if that interests you, that's something that is really, I won't say unique to primary care, but you don't get a whole lot of prep time, okay? You don't review cases before you see the people. It's like they walk in and you're, you know, it's go time, right? Um, 
The other thing you have to really like is problem solving. And if you've ever like, looked at some of these cases that you know, you'll, you'll find uh, the New York Times, there's once in the magazine section, every, you know, every week, I think, there's uh, some uh, post from a doctor at Yale about some crazy case uh, and how that gets settled. Um, there's, uh, you know, these fascinating discussions that you have with yourself all the time. It's like, you know, what is this? I, it looks familiar. Let me narrow this down. Well, if I move this here and I move that there, and look, where do I look this up? How do I find this? It's constant problem solving. Okay. Eventually, we developed this program called problem based learning. Problem based learning is taking you guys as first year medical students, putting you in a room, giving you a case and say, solve it. And you have, you know, and they will not give you any real guidance more so than, okay, that's a good point. If that's true, this is true. And really just to develop that ability to define a problem and solve that problem and see what's what, okay? Um, oh, you also have to like be a busybody. Right? A busybody is basically somebody who's into everybody else's business, right? Now, I will tell you that most of the questions you ask your patients would basically land you in jail if you ask them in a bar, right? I mean, you're asking intimate details. You're asking them about their sexuality. You're asking them about their habits. You're asking them about their hobbies, their likes, their dislikes. I mean, you know, people come in and tell you things that are absolutely incredibly intimate. And, you know, you're... Your obligation, of course, is to keep it between you and your patient. And at the same time, you're going to have to counsel people about certain behaviors that are like really things that may get in the way of your common beliefs. So you have to be willing to literally have these conversations with patients. But at the same time, you're going to have to be, pro you have to be able to pry. And I've seen lots of times where you know, medical students or residents they have a very hard time asking these questions, but these questions, or well, the answers to these questions are, are really, really critical. Okay. One of the other things uh, that you have to be willing to do is to earn respect, right? I mean, a lot of times people walk in and think like, oh, you're a doctor, you know? So therefore automatically, you know, there's a level of respect. I mean, my, I work in basically a blue collar environment and I can tell you that I have to earn the respect of my patients. I mean, they are certainly respectful, but as far as if they really respect me, it's going to be kind of show me the money. You've got to prove to me, you know, that, that you care about me. You have to prove to me that you know what's going on, that you can help me. And that's, you know, a really important part of it. So you have to be willing to earn the respect and don't walk in and think that, you know, that's it. You know, you can go to the headline in, uh, in a fancy restaurant and say, oh, I'm Dr. Mark. And they'll say, yeah, <laughs> that's nice. Uh, you're number 42 to get in the back of the line, right? So um, there's, you know, there, there's, there is certainly a certain um, uh, level of respect that the profession still gets. And certainly since COVID, I mean, it, it's definitely improved. I mean, the number of medical school applications this year have skyrocketed and it's amazing because you know we were sort of on a steady downish trend and now all of a sudden there are all of these things because people realize that yeah you can make a difference and you there were all of these people who were going in there you know in the midst of this thing this pandemic with garbage bags on their feet because they were out of booties or whatever else taking care of these people and at seven o'clock people are banging pots and screaming out the window thanking all the, all, all the essential workers, the first responders, the nurses, the bus drivers, all these people, everything took on a greater sense of meaning. Whether it'll stick, I don't know, but I mean, it, it certainly is important. So you have to be able to do that. Um, you're gonna make a difference. You definitely make a difference. And that has to be important to you. Um, you know, the primary goal of any physician uh, is to want to make a difference. And uh, all the other motivators, really, they're nice and they're helpful, but uh, nothing happens without that hard work and that level of commitment. 
and you will make a difference. Um, your, your patients will live better, they'll live longer, um, and they'll be, and they will be appreciative in some way. And even when, you know, it comes the 11th hour and you're, you're doing all you can to try to save somebody, you'll make that difference too, because you may help keep that patient home so they could die in their own bed, or you might be able to sit at the bedside in the hospital or can console the family or do something, but your presence really matters. And, and yes, you do make a difference. You know, you have to be willing to be the last person in the room. That's another thing. You can't, this is, this is no, um, this is no job for the fainted heart, you know. Um, people will come in, specialists will come in, they will give you their opinions, they will give you their consultations, they will give you their advice, they will do this, they will do that. At the end of the day, you're going to have to figure this all out. So you're going to sit there scratching your head and you're going to sit there trying to understand, okay, wow, first of all, did I understand everything he said? Because like, this is like major league smart stuff. Uh, and how do I turn that into something for my patient? How do, how do I implement all of this advice? And I'm getting it from six ways. I'm getting it from renal. I'm getting it from hematology. I'm getting it from infectious diseases and pulmonary. At the end of the day, what do I do with that patient? You're the last person in the room. So you have to be the guy who sits there. Uh, and I'm using guy, please, in the most generic of terms. Uh, and make make that make that choice and implement that treatment because you're the bottom line, you know, at this point. Um, now here comes the harder parts. Those are the easy parts. Now you have to live up to your own expectations. Okay, that is not easy, right? Okay, um, you you have to know who you are. You have to know what you want. You have to set it all up. And you know there there's a there's a personality drawn to medicine that is often people who are never satisfied with where we are. I mean, look at the presentation before. I mean, just look look at Dr. Kerko. I mean, that's inc this is who who wouldn't give up at some point? You know, this is what are you fighting? You're fighting you know sexism. You're fighting uh, culturalism, naturalism, all these other things, and you, you spent your whole life developing a product that may or may not ever pan out. I mean, you, you've got to be, believe in yourself, but at the same time, you have to keep driving to live up to those own expectations that you have for yourself. Uh, you have to enjoy the excitement of sharing a case with specialty experts, okay? Because primary care, I tell people, look, you can have the world's greatest symphonic orchestra, uh, you could have the best people, the best cellists, the best violin, what, all these people in this group. But without a conductor, it's going to be a lot of noise, right? And it may be beautiful noise, but it's going to be noise. And it's not going to be the symphony that you paid for. So you have to be, you're that guy, again, in quotation. And what you really have to do is you have to be in a position where you're never going to know what the specialists know. You're never going to have the skills that the specialist has. It's impossible, right? They're spending their whole life as dedicated as you are to what they do, but that's a piece of it, right? So, but you have to have, you have to be tuned in to what they're talking about. You have to understand it. You have to be educated enough that you can be part of the conversation and you have to learn to listen. You must listen. And more importantly than that, you can't be intimidated to ask questions. You have to ask questions. If it, if it doesn't work out in your brain, if it doesn't make sense, then it may not. And you've got to be able to question it. It takes a lot of gumption to stand up and say, you know, hey, Dr. Langer, I don't think that procedure, you know, is really going to work with this patient because, and you better have a good because. So, that's, you know, but that there's the excitement in that, right? Because it keeps you fresh. It keeps you learning. You can, like I said, every case is different. So, you know, if, if there's a procedure that they're going to do in invasive cardiology, I had a patient who has came and called me up on the phone. He had uh, like a TIA, which is like a transient ischemic attack, meaning that he had a drop of blood flow to his brain. He had a kind of stroke symptoms. 
guy's epitome of health. I mean, he's an Olympic fencer. This guy is healthy, 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 right? Went to a local emergency room. By then he was fine. And when the emergency room sent him home, and you know what they said? Get in touch with your doctor. So what do you do? Well, you go through all the risk factors. You talk about all these things. And then you've got this situation where like, well, this doesn't make any sense. Like, you know, he didn't have, a, he didn't have this because he has cholesterol plaque. He's 50 years old. He's healthy. He has normal cholesterol numbers. He has normal blood pressure. He has no family history. What is going on? So you look a little bit further. You look a little bit further. Then you find out that he has this little tiny hole in his heart called a PFO that goes between two chambers of the heart and allows tiny microscopic clots to form, not microscopic, but small clots to form. And then boom, one translates to from the right side to the left side, upstream to the brain, and that's it. Very nice. And now you call the interventional cardiologist, all right? And now you have a story. And now they're gonna to explain to you what their procedure is and what their technique is. And you're gonna to have to listen to understand it. And then after that, you're part of that team. And then after that patient has that procedure done, guess where they're going? They're coming back to you. And then they're gonna ask you about like, you know, what are my activities? What can I do? Uh, is it safe for me to do this? Do, you know, be sure your patient doesn't develop any kind of, you know, irrational fear because of the, having had this quote unquote cardiac event, right? So you have to really be able to share and accept the sharing and also the, um, uh, the, the challenge of uh, the expert opinions. And that's, it's really wonderful. It's very, boy, it makes your day go really fast. Like really fast, like too fast. Like you haven't done the work yet because you're still spending three hours working on one case. Um, the other thing that's really true about all of medicine, but finds a special place in primary care is you have a great opportunity to impact social medicine. And not as a grandstander. I mean, you know, you don't have the skills to be the plastic surgeon who goes off to other parts of the world and corrects cleft palates on people. You don't have that skill. Uh, but you do have the skill mm -hmm. to go to you know, uh, a church uh, and give a talk about diet and hypertension. Or you do have a skill to talk about, you know, work in a, in a, a free clinic for illegal aliens. And yeah, it might be in the basement of, you know, Kings County Hospital and it might be a place that, you know, you might not be up to your speed and you're basically taking home samples and things like that from your office so that you have them for patients. But you have that ability to do this on, on it's a different level. It's, it's the ground level, it's the people, it's really taking care of you know, people who really need you uh, as the others are too, but this is on a, on a huge impact. Um, you'd be amazed. I mean, I, I, got, I got an award from uh, Bishop Frank O. White, o, o. White um, in 19, I forgot, oh, 2002 um, for a program of teaching uh, students uh, photography in the basement of a, uh, of a church in uh, Bushwick, Brooklyn. And, you know, what does that have to do with medicine? Well, it has a lot to do with medicine because during that time that I was with them, I was able to talk to them about other issues. I was talking to them, to the young girls about, you know, caution with pregnancies, STDs. I mean, guys watching out for, you know, their health and particular protection and drug use and drug abuse and drug selling. And, you know, this, it was just a segue into that. But basically, I, I really, it was my knowledge of, of medicine that really got me through this. Okay. Um, so social medicine is, is part of your life every day. It's part of your life in the office too. I mean, you know, I'm right here on 38th Street in Manhattan and, you know, I have a very privileged clientele as well. Um, but there'll be patients whose insurance will change and you don't accept it anymore. 
and you say it's okay you know you can come in anyway i've been taking care of you for 15 years i'm not gonna stop taking care of you now right and pay me if you can don't pay me if you can you know um th there are things that you do on a daily on a daily basis that really does make does make a difference and then for me one of the biggest pros in being a primary care doctor is that i get to learn something new every single day i mean there is not a day that goes by that I have not learned something new. And it can be from kind of mull through a, a pile of journals uh, and then saying, mm, that's interesting, or doing a conference like this. Uh, and, and truthfully, through these Zoom conferences, I'm like racking up the conferences. Um, great opportunity to learn, but most importantly, to learn from your patients. Uh, and you have to realize that there are no two patients even if they come in, both two patients walk in, they're both 30 years old, they both say I have a sore throat. Those are two totally different stories. And there may be two totally different causes of that sore throat. And that's your job. You have to kind of go, go with that. Um, all right, so that's the good news. <laughs> so what about the cons? Well, here are the cons. You work really, 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 really hard. I mean, you really do work hard. Um, and that's, pretty obvious. Um, you make less money than your friends, make less money than your friends in medicine, certainly make less money than your friends in finance. Uh, and, you know, that's got to be okay, right? You know, again, it's got to be okay. You'll live a nice life. I'm not, you're not going to starve. Your family's not going to starve. Everybody's going to have what they need, but you're not going to make a lot of money. Um, you're not likely to get a TV series, even though Dr. Kildare did have a TV series. Uh, these days, you know, there's not enough drama in primary care. You know, so you're not going to get that now. I mean, you know, there are some guys who get a TV series, you know, a special on Netflix or something. But, you know, chances are it's not going to be primary care people. Or that. So, you know, it's like it's too long, too much stuff, not enough drama. But that doesn't really bother you, right? Doesn't bother me, so it's okay. I like watching them instead. I don't do that well on camera. Um, the other thing is you worry a lot. You really, really worry a lot, okay? A lot. And um, there are nights where, you know, you go home and you're sitting there and your wife's cooked a really nice dinner. She's happy to have you home. You're sitting there and you're not all there, right? Because you're something's bothering you about a case or somebody calls you on your cell phone middle of the meal and this is like it. You do, you know, you do worry a lot. And then you do it because you care. And you also do it for another reason that's very important that you're basically insecure. I mean, I've been doing this a long time. And I want to tell you the biggest trap that you can fall into is be too cocksure that you know what you're doing. You have to always question your decisions. You have to always think about those things. And you have to be willing to do that. You know? You're going to miss a lot of dinners. Uh, you're going to be a very different person. Um, I think in general, when you're a doctor, this all applies, right? I used to tell medical students, you know, that, well, remember when you used to go to the club and you'd stand there with your friend and you'd be looking across the room and there would be the other person who looks really, really interesting and you want to get to know him, her. And, you know, those were those days. Now you're sitting there with your friend and going, oh, I see that person across the room. I would get some thyroid checks on that person because I think they have a goiter and then your, your view on the world becomes different. Your index of suspicion becomes higher. Lots of things happen and you miss a lot of dinners. And sometimes you're heartbroken. You really are heartbroken. Um, listen, I've, I've written lots and lots of journal articles. I've, written lots of opinion pieces. Uh, I've been part of, you know, many different clinical studies. Um, but honestly, the, the piece that I am actually most proud of, well, not most proud of, but maybe best defines me, is this one here. It's, at, um, it's called Ode to My First Patient. And I couldn't manage to get the whole thing onto the slide, so. I'm going to take a minute to read it to you, and um, 
uh, just indulge me with this, okay? I'm gonna try to, uh, I'll read it a little bit faster, okay? So they said that positions are hard, callous and desensitized. And until yesterday, I would have argued vehemently that I'm different, but these defenses are not part of what I am. And today, however, I am forced to agree. He was one of my first patients, became as close a friend as Eddie, although we never shared a beer, a movie, or a meal. We established a close community relationship, one so intimate that I truly began to pay, feel his pain and suffering. He wandered into my office when I was only two weeks out of my hospital training. He was casually referred by a local chiropractor, and he was having pain in his leg and a pain that increased with walking and was relieved by rest. He was overweight, he smoked two packs of cigarettes a day, loved rich food. I listened intently as he told me the symptoms and asked me and asked all the clinical questions in the most professional and didactic manner. As I fashioned my textbook questions, he would interrupt with a quote unquote, not for mixed company joke. I laughed politely and returned to my questioning and it taught me early a good doctor is not just a good clinician, um, but a good listener. I examined him, confirmed my suspicions, and referred him to a vascular surgeon for repair of a cholesterol damaged artery in his left leg. I advised him, no, I insisted that he quit smoking, lose weight, change his diet. He agreed, and he helped me hang a picture on my wall. He came back the next week to review his lab tests, all of which were terrible. High-risk cholesterol, kidney damage, liver damage, his chest x-ray and spirometry showed marked decreased lung function, his heart was enlarged. I pontificated on his uncertain future. He didn't change his ways and went out to his car and, and scheduled him for a femoral, femoral popliteal bypass. He went out to his car and he brought me back a framed Victorian poster. He gave it to me. I was in the midst of decorating my office. Right? He said, enjoy it, doc. It's just not my taste. Huh? Well, I loved it. I hung it in my consultation room and the surgery went well. It's been six years since that surgery and Ed was only 60, but he, had li he did little to ensure making it to 70. We argued, I begged, I threatened, advised, and always said, and he always said he would try, and he always did for a while. My professional advice turned into emotional pleading and I became aware that my begging was directed at protecting me from an inevitable outcome, an outcome that would hurt me deeply. I kept pleading, the condition became worse and his heart failed. He underwent quadruple bypass surgery, his lungs were so bad Post-operative cost was twice as long as it should have been. Finally, he was discharged. He underwent six weeks of cardiac rehabilitation. And finally, he was discharged to his upstate home. I saw him last week. He seemed so much improved. He had quit smoking. He lost 60 pounds. He was exercised. And I was encouraged for the first time since I met him. And uh, that was also the last time I ever saw him. Yesterday, his, his grasp closed off. His heart failed. And Ed died. I was angry at Ed because he really hurt me. He made me care too much. He made me learn to be hard, forced me to become more of a realist and less of a key hurt. He made me miss him and he left behind a poster to remind me of how much I loved him. I will tell you that I still choke up when I read that. And that was the first thing I ever published and probably one of the most important for me. It helped me grow through that and also I think just to share what actually is involved there. So um, let's see, I'm, I'm gonna try to leave some time for questions if you like. Uh, I'm calling this the end, I'm calling it actually the beginning for both of us. Um, any questions or doubts or issues? Hey, great, great story, obviously. Um, you know, I, th I think we're in different realms, but at the same time, I go through this on a daily basis where there's people you just develop a relationship with you want, you want to change and you know it's true what is the motivation for that is it internal within you or is it really trying to make them better is it, is it you know to prove your self-worth in a way as a good doctor if you can convince someone to change their ways it's something that i deal with constantly uh, and i'm still starting out at this so obviously you, you probably figured out a few ways to deal with it more so than i have um where do you see you know how do you see primary care changing post-pandemic, you know, what changes has your office gone through already and what do you see in the future? Yeah, I mean, well, we, 
we, we stayed in the office through this whole pandemic. So uh, we were doing, obviously, in March and April, a lot of telemed type things, uh, just phone calls, literally hundreds of phone calls, people who had COVID, people who thought they had COVID. Uh, I was also in the hospital seeing my patients there. Um, so it, it really, the amazing thing about COVID was it, it set us back three months in actually taking care of patients who had anything but COVID. And uh, we spent like the summer kind of catching up and seeing the, you know, our diabetic patients, our hypertensive patients, our hyperlipidemic patients, because they were, you know, literally ignored through this whole thing. Uh, post pandemic, uh, I think I would like just to get back to regular business, to be perfectly honest. Uh, yeah. I think patients are, they're appreciative. They're very appreciative. Um, I think it'll, it'll stick. Uh, they tend to trust us more because with all of the confusing information that was coming out and the, you know, how to navigate the political front and all this other stuff, everything happening at the same time. Look, I wrote more antidepressant and anti-anxiety medications in six months than I've written in six years, right? And when you do that, you're really developing a, a, a huge depend, a huge support network with your patients. So I think, I think things are going to I think patients do respect us more. And like I was saying, there's so, you know, medical school applications are like taken off now. And I think people respect doctors in general more. And I think our place in, in primary care was, is, is better appreciated, honestly. Yeah. You know, one student asked about how do you continue your compassionate and patient-centered care, giving time constraints associated with being a physician and obviously, you know, day to day, I think, you know, you, how many patients do you see on a day? I see probably 18 to 20 patients. A day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know, I know the people who are working, you know, clinics and, you know, the, the, they're probably seeing more. Um, you know, I never feel rushed with a patient. Um, you know, you kind of try to stack your appointments so that you can get your simple things in and out and spend the time that you need to with patients. It's not always possible. Um, but you know, I, I think, I don't want that to become an excuse. And I think it's become an excuse. Um, spend your time. You might run a little late. You might not get home, you know, when you expect to, uh, you know, office. They put our phones on, you know, on service at four o'clock. I'm here until 6.30 or seven, you know, that's push your stuff down the road. Do your paperwork after, do what you have to. Don't take away the time of your patients because it's going to save you time in the end, actually, if you really do spend that time. Absolutely. Uh, let me see. There's, I mean, questions are pouring in. People, a lot of thank you for sharing your story, obviously. Oh, thanks um, for the opportunity. Let me see. You know, one, one, uh, one participant asked, how many of the 18 to 20 patients do you form a long-term relationship with? Um, I think, I mean, I don't know. I think the goal would be all of them, but I'm not sure what the reality of that is. Right. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, I think the reality is, uh, I, I mean, I, I, if you, a long-term relationship means that you're seeing the patients for a long time, it's probably all of them, right? I mean, because it's very, you know, insurance has changed, patients move and things like that happen. But basically, all of your patients kind of stick. Um, you know, some are emotionally more tied to you than others. Uh, and that happens by accident, by common interest. You know, I mean, uh, on, on a non-COVID year, Christmas Eve, my wife and I will go out and stop by, you know, 10 different, you know, patients' homes just to wish them happy holiday, have a, have a drink and a little antipasta and then, you know, move along the way. Um, but those, those patients are there, you know, those are different patients, um, but for a long-term relationship that is supportive and you know who they are and they know who you are and you care about them, it's the vast majority of them. You know, yeah. um, one, one participant asked, you know, how do you approach resistance to care um, with patients even that you've seen for a long time? You know, what are some of the tricks and techniques you use or... And there are no, there are no tricks. Um, I mean, a good example is the resistance that we're getting to the COVID vaccine, right? So yeah. there's been so much bad information out there. And, uh, you know, I have patients come in and say, oh, I, 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 don't, I don't know if I'm going to take that vaccine. 
You know, why not? And it's always because there's some misunderstanding, right? So in five minutes of explaining the vaccine, I mean, just like we heard before, you know, the minuscule amount and what this actually does and how the vaccine works and that it wasn't rushed out. It didn't happen in nine months. It happened since how long was she doing that? 1986 or whatever, right? This is, this is an evolution in medical technology that is remarkable. And uh, the vaccine is safe. And, you know, I took it. Uh, I would recommend everybody take it, but I think it's through education. I think the biggest stumbling block that you have with patients' compliance is that they don't understand what they're talking about. And that takes you time. You do have to, you know, you don't challenge them, but you say, well, look, let me, let me tell you how I see it. This is the science. This is the study. This is what's going on. And let's, let's go from there and think about it, you know, just think about it. Uh, a lot of students asking about um, telemedicine. Uh, I, I think, you know, rather than dive into individual specific questions about it, I think just what do you think about it? How have you guys incorporated it? Is it is it the future? Is it going to end? Yeah. What do you think? Well, uh, well, I'll tell you, honestly, I'm not a huge fan um, because I think in primary care, you know, you need to really get hands on. Um, I, I, I do use the telephone a lot because I do know my patients and things. I'm not sure the telemed adds much to me, you know, um, because you can't, you can't show me, you know, what you're feeling. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there'll always be a place for it. I think it's been great for patients who are displaced and whatnot, keeping in touch. Um, I'm okay with the phone. I mean, I have no problem, you know, speaking to people on the phone and, uh, trying to figure out what's going on, but uh, it, it has, it's had its place, it's limited. I don't think it can ever replace, uh, you know, hands-on medicine. In, in, in. That's definitely a difference, I think, um, not, not a total difference, but one of the differences between what we do, um, you know, neurosurgery, we're based on imaging. And so with an MRI, we can pretty much say there's a tumor, it has to come out. Whereas when someone comes into your office, they're a mystery, right? They're a black box and it's kind of un unpeeling to figure out what exactly is going on. And I think that in those settings, the physical exam, just meeting someone, watching how they interact, watching how they move, uh, all, all gives you so much information, you know? Um, and in that, that regard, I completely agree with you. Uh, this is an interesting question. You know, how do you, how do you set boundaries for yourself to not get too attached for a patient or do you? I missed the last part. How do you not? How do you, how do you set boundaries to not let yourself get too attached to a particular patient, or do you set boundaries? Yeah, yeah. I, I look. I've been burned plenty of times. You know, I've been to more wakes than I want to count. Um, I I don't think you can. I think once once you start setting boundaries, um, then you're you're probably not giving of yourself a hundred percent. I think you have to learn how to build a, you know, your own personal defense to it and understand there's a point at which, you know, like that piece that I read, I was a kid then. I mean, you know, I, I, do, I would not have the same level of guilt for his death now as I did then, um, because I know I did everything I could do. I, you know, pushed it, but I didn't have any limitations on what I, what I would do for this guy until the inevitable, and when the inevitable happens, it happens. You know? um, so those boundaries are, you know, are good. And you, you have, you know, there's an intimacy, you walk a thin line with the intimacy too, right? Because you know, one of my, my grandson's best line when his brother was, was bothering him, he said, I can't fix it. I'm not the doctor of everything, you know? And that's pretty much, you know, I have a t-shirt that says that now. So you do have to, you know, realize your own limitations and the limitations of life and death. Yeah. So what do you, what do you appreciate from the specialists that you, you often refer to? I mean, how do you, how do you maintain team-based approach to caring for someone? You know, what, it, what makes a good referral or a good specialist who works with you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, well, first I keep my stable very small. I mean, I, you know, I try, there are people who I, I trust, um, and uh, you know, work well with me or together with my patients, whatever, based on personalities and things. Um, but I do my homework. I really do do my homework. And I think before you really call in a specialist, um, you have to know what you're asking for and you have to know what they can provide. And at the same time, 
um, you have to be respectful of, of their opinions. And I think those are the most important things. So if I, if I have a neurosurgery case, um, you know, often I will have a good suspicion of what's going on at that time. But at the same time, I don't know anything about how to fix it. I don't know, I don't know the technology. So I'll, I'll read it, you know, I'll look at it and I'll listen really, really hard. And then, you know, I've been in operating rooms, I've been in angiogram suites on a regular basis because I think it's, you know, it's fascinating to see the whole case through, you know, from diagnosis, to treatment, and then you get the post-op, you know, it's the approach. So you have to know your people. You pick your people that you work well with, that you trust, and, uh, you know, they take care of you, you take care of them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've got a, a little bit of a challenging question, I think. This is with the increasing independence of uh, nurse practitioners and physician assistants, especially in primary care. Um, how do you see the role of the primary care physician being differentiated and evolving versus the role of the MPs and the PAs? Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm going to, I'll tread lightly on this one a little bit. But, <laughs> it's, it's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. It's a great question. Yeah. Uh, so primary care is a little bit different, okay, because I think that nurse practitioners and physicians assistants are a great asset, and I think they can learn a whole lot about, you know, their, about a specialty, right, so an orthopedic PA is going to be different than a primary care PA, right, there's going to be a certain knowledge base, etc. Um, I think that it's critical that the physician incorporate them into the practice, uh, educate them as they go, uh, and not that they're not educated, but educated them in their, their practice. Uh, and most importantly, I mean, understand that this is a, you know, a growing thing. You, you, take, you treat them like any other colleague. You, you discuss it. Unfortunately, what's happened is that you know, physicians will use physician's assistance in, in lieu of themselves. And you know, they'll cut out early and the physician assistant will see the next three or four patients or whatever else, or they'll, you know, they'll, they'll, it's a nice day, they'll play some golf, you know, whatever. We all are human beings and there's a tendency to do that. I think people fall back on them too much, but I think in conjunction with the physician, they're enormous. I mean, you, you interact all the time with your PAs and stuff. They're not, you know, they're not practicing your medicine. They're, they're just part of your team, right? So, yeah. That's, I think, I think the mistake is with the physician for not incorporating the PA enough into the decision making. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great point. I think, you know, it's, it's going to be a team based approach. I think there's plenty of room for everyone in the field, and there's a need, right? We need people in primary care. And, uh, and therefore, you know, it's about empowering and educating the people to move forward and, and you know, you help out. Uh, no. Listen, Dr. Mark, thank you so much for your time. Uh, fantastic you. lecture. Good. We're coming up next with the medical school, actually. Um, members of the medical school are going to be talking about you know, how to get in and what to expect. Um, can't thank you enough for your time. Uh, we look forward to having you in the future. I think a very valuable and important component of, of exposing students to medicine. Um, and I'm gracious that you were able to make up for my uh, <laughs> inability to get you on board earlier. No, so, it's okay. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thank you. All right, everyone. We're going to bring in the next team. So thanks so much. Okay, bye -bye.